online. So this is the second session of the Systematic Review Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Tom Harrod. I'm the Research Support Librarian at the Himmelfarb Health Sciences Library. And the topic for the session today is uh, some of the systematic review guidelines like PRISMA and Cochrane that can help you in performing a systematic review. So also thank you all for being here and welcome everyone uh, who was able to come. So here is the outline of the entire seminar series. Last time, so two weeks ago, I spoke about the types of reviews. Mostly this was looking at comparing classical review articles with systematic reviews and why they're different and what are the factors and characteristics that, that make a systematic review systematic. Uh, this is the session we'll be talking about today. And as I mentioned last time, we will be um, uh, uh, roughly every two weeks, there'll be a new session. So I wanted to, uh, and let me put this in the chat. This is the guide that goes along with this series. And so I post like for last week, I posted the slides and a recording. I'm going to update that recording um, with one that has captioning, but I have not gotten around to doing that, so the, fixing the captioning on that. I will do that as soon as I can. And for this session, I've added the slides and will again add the recording when I'm able to properly do the captioning. So again, that is the, the guide that goes along with that. And I want to encourage people, and a lot of people have done this, if you want, I have a email that I send out the day before each session, because these are broken up two weeks apart, so it's kind of hard to track, I know. Um, so if you want me, if you want to be on that email reminder list, please send me an email, and I will put my email address here in the chat. Send me an email and just say, please add me to the list, I'll put you on the list, and there's all I do is send an email reminder the day before each session. You won't be spammed or anything like that. It, that's that's the limit of what I'll be sending you. Um, so just want to put those things out there to get that out of the way. Uh, so back to this. So this is the rough outline of what I want to talk about in this session. So the purpose of these documents, why they exist and how they're helpful. I want to look at some examples of the documents, some of the more common ones, and then look at some of the, I mean, I guess it depends what field you're in, but less common uh, uh, documents. And we'll look at them and kind of get an idea of what they're about and how they can help you. So the purpose of these documents is uh, you have to take a step back and you know, as one of the things that we talked about with the first session is that systematic reviews are methodologically quite rigorous and really daunting. Uh, I know when I do uh, sessions with students and faculty and we go through what they can expect in the process, I know that first meeting, if, if they don't have experience or knowledge of systematic reviews, that first meeting is often quite daunting because it's absolutely overwhelming to think about all the methodological rigor that goes into it. Um, and performing a proper systematic review takes time and attention to detail because you're going to be reporting the results of what you did. And so that requires a really careful attention to detail. And so that's not, it's not obvious. I think, you know, what should I be taking note of? What should I be keeping track of as I go along? And that's where these guidelines can really help. Um, the expectations of journal editors and reviewers. So I can say this is something I've noted. If you look at systematic reviews published 10 years ago, um, and I'm not saying all of them, but many systematic reviews published 10 years ago, and you look at the methodology, you'll think, wow, is this really a systematic review? This isn't what I had in mind for a systematic review. And that is less so today. Um, and I believe the reason for that is journal editors and reviewers have become more aware of what a systematic review means. And so I think their standards have increased. And I think this can be clearly seen in looking at the types of things that were, that have been published as a, you know, quote unquote, systematic review over the years. You'll see the quality of the average review or the methodological rigor of the average review 
I believe has improved or you know gone up, and I believe it's because uh, these standards that exist and this guidance that exist has become more widely known, and so people have a much stronger idea of what they should be seeing. Um, so that I think is really the purpose of these documents, and that's how I kind of want to frame the issue. Um, but what's great is the guidance is available. It's overwhelming, it's difficult, uh, a lot of detail involved, but there's guidance available. So one of those that you've probably heard of, if you've had any, uh, you know, you've been in the world of systematic reviews at all, is you've heard uh, PRISMA. You've almost certainly heard that uh, spoken about. So it stands for the Preferred Reporting Items for Systematic Reviews and Meta-Analyses. Um, and the way that you may have seen this is if you've read systematic reviews, um, you'll often see in the methods section a line early on, you know, we followed the PRISMA guidelines, we followed the PRISMA checklist. Um, and whether they did or not is can be another question, but it's often stated, we follow the PRISMA checklist. Uh, and so what the PRISMA checklist is, is a 27 item checklist. It ensures thorough and accurate reporting of systematic reviews. And so what I'm gonna do is go to the PRISMA website and just show you um, what this looks like. So the PRISMA checklist, and I'll just go ahead and throw this URL into the into the chat as well. There's a 2020 update, so that's an important thing. If you have an older version of this that was updated relatively recently, um, the, the new version is largely the same with some tweaks here and there, but it's obviously best to be using the most up-to-date version. So let's look at what those items are. So this is the checklist. And it, what it's meant for is, as you as the systematic reviewer, when you're writing up your manuscript, you go through the checklist and you say, where did each of these items show up? You know, did I perform this item? And if I did, where is it in my manuscript? That's the idea behind the checklist. Um, and you'll see many of the 27 items, it's deceptive. Uh, many of them have sub items. So I don't know how many total items there are, <clears throat> but this is these, it goes through and, you know, you'll see title, abstract, introduction, methods, goes through piece by piece uh, of a manuscript, of a typical manuscript, where these bits of information should show up. Uh, so Prisma is, very commonly cited in the methods section of a systematic review. In fact, I would I would wager if you were to look for 10 systematic reviews, you'd see the phrase Prisma mentioned in at least eight of them um, because it's it's mentioned in a lot. But the one thing I think that's a little deceptive is it's one thing to say we followed the Prisma checklist it's another thing to have actually done every single one of these things. Um, and uh, I think those are two different things, but um, so these are, I mean, as the name implies, these are the preferred reporting items when you're writing up a systematic review or a meta-analysis. So for instance, one that is very helpful is number one, the title, identify the report as a systematic review, which means, in the title, it should say, you know, blah, 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 a systematic review. So the phrase systematic review shows up in the title and you think, well, what's, who cares? That makes it easy to find. So I know as a librarian, when I'm looking for systematic reviews, I'll often do a search, you know, let's say diabetes mellitus and systematic review in the title. So I will search for the phrase systematic review in the title of the articles that I'm searching for because I know of this Prisma item number one, that that's the, you know, one of the standards is to identify the article as a systematic review in the title. Um, so that's just one of them. And you can look through this list and see some of these are appropriate, some of them aren't. I'm not saying that every systematic review has to check off every one of these, but what's nice is to take a look at this before you get started, because I think it helps contextualize the work that you're doing a little bit. Um, 
I think Prism really helps you, guides you in developing a protocol because you can't report something if you didn't do it in the first place. And so if you have an idea of what you're going to be reporting, i.e. Prisma, it can help you to plan the process um, in developing, you know, a careful protocol for what you're doing. Um, so I think it helps to be familiar with Prisma early on so you know what kinds of things you'll be expected to report. Um, but as I said, not every systematic review will report all 27 items. So I don't want to imply that um, or that if you don't check off all 27 plus boxes, you it's not a systematic review. But I would say that, um, and this is actually a plug for librarians, um, a shameless plug for my profession is that there have been studies that have shown where folks have with the Prisma checklist gone over published systematic reviews and seen how closely they adhered, how many of the items they checked off. And it was found that systematic reviews that specifically mentioned the help of a librarian were more likely to, or checked off on average, more of the 27 items, the 27 plus items. Um, so it's a way of actually evaluating the quality of a systematic review as well. And people have used it in studies to say, you know, compare the quality. So this one had a librarian and this one didn't, or whatever other factor they're looking at and to uh, evaluate the quality. Um, so that's for Prisma. And I put that out there in the chat box. The next one that you've pretty good chance you've heard of if you're anywhere in the world of systematic reviews is Cochrane. You'll hear Cochrane talked about a lot, the Cochrane collaboration. So this is a multinational organization that's headquartered in the UK and they've been around for a little while and they seek to promote evidence-based medical decision-making. And this is largely based on the creation of high quality systematic reviews. Um, so let me uh, put the URL in here. So what they've created is the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews of Interventions. Um, this is kind of the, a go-to resource. So it is, this is the online version of this. Um, you see 26 parts, pardon me. And it goes through every phase of performing a systematic review. So, well, my favorite's phase, searching and selecting studies. Um, and so this is my other little uh, self-serving plug here. Uh, you should have a librarian on your team. Um, that's Cochrane themselves say that. Uh, but it goes through step-by-step how to perform a systematic review because i think that's what's overwhelming to people is they know about all the parts that go into it but how do i do this it's totally overwhelming at first cochrane handbook is incredibly useful for that um, it's very thorough and very long so i'm not saying you're going to sit down and you know read this in one sitting it's probably not the most uh, engaging reading you could have but it's a very useful reference tool I would say in performing a systematic review, I go to this all the time for information. Um, so I want to put that out there. And Cochrane is one of those names that, you know, if names that are synonymous with systematic reviews, Cochrane, Prisma, those names that you hear, um, and Cochrane reviews. So you can go to the Cochrane database and they publish systematic reviews under the Cochrane you know, under the name, under the Cochrane imprint or whatever you want to call it, they are extremely high quality systematic reviews. Those are ones that have checked off every box on Prisma. Um, to be accepted as a Cochrane review, you have to be, you have to have dotted every I and crossed every T um, to make a extremely high quality review. Uh, but what's also great is things like their handbook for systematic reviews of interventions. Um, another thing that's pretty recent with Cochrane, which I found helpful, and I've, I've just kind of come across this recently is, I don't know the pronunciation, but M-E-C-I-R, MECIR, I don't know, Methodological Expectations of Cochrane Intervention Reviews. So these are standards that it's, 
the way they describe it. These are standards that should guide the content conduct and reporting of a Cochrane intervention review. Um, and so that's, let me go ahead and toss that into the chat as well. And we'll go there quickly. Uh, so this is, and these are interspersed throughout the handbook. Uh, so the handbook is sort of this free text, you know, long form description of doing the process. These MECIRs are, um, let me see, where is it? Um, this is a list of, it's 128 pages, so it's not a small document either, but these are, um, and I'm sorry, let me go through. Sorry for the scrolling. I know that can be quite annoying on a WebEx, so I apologize until I, I have to apologize. I know oh, I'm not hitting one. Um, let me just click on one of these things. Uh, so they are a little, a standard and then a rationale for that. And so the, you'll see these MECIRs interspersed throughout the handbook, but there's also this MECIR manual, which goes through all of those standards. It's probably more useful to run across them within the context of the Cochrane handbook, because it gives you a context as opposed to just a hundred pages of this, you know, what you're seeing here, but it, it's nice because it gives you a standard, a discrete standard, and then a rationale, and then they elaborate on what's expected for that. So those are two kind of Cochrane tools that can be useful. Again, like I said, these pop up, they've now, in the most recent version of the handbook, they've interspersed these where appropriate. So that's probably the way you'll most likely come across them, but they can be useful little nuggets of, uh, of guidance. Um, so kind of coming towards the end, there are other guidelines that I want to talk about. So Cochrane is the world of medicine. Um, however, there are other standards and one of those is the Joanna Briggs Institute, which um, to my knowledge is more uh, nursing. Um, so let me go to their documents. They have a manual on performing systematic reviews as well. So I don't know why this isn't loading. Um, we will give that a moment. I put it in the chat. Um, well, we'll give that a moment to load and then I'll go to the other thing, which was Prisma. So we looked at the basic Prisma guidelines, but what the folks who do Prisma have also been doing is creating extensions and so they have a number of extensions here and it looks like it always seems to me kind of a, a random list of these are the extensions um kind of a hodgepodge but the really useful one i find or the one that i come to the most often is the prisma extension for scoping reviews so remember we talked about that last time there are systematic reviews and then there is a subset or what I consider kind of a subset within systematic reviews, which are scoping reviews. And the scoping review is uh, methodologically performed in a very similar way as the, as a systematic review, but it has different objectives, different outcomes. The systematic review, a systematic review is typically answering a discrete, you know, in medicine kind of clinically relevant question. So answering a question, uh, whereas a scoping review is more of a look at the literature itself. So it's looking at um, the characteristics of the literature, who's writing about this topic, who are they writing to, with the goal of identifying gaps in the literature. Um, that's one of the purposes of a scoping review. So it's methodologically pretty similar, but the outcomes are different. And so Prisma, have they have been developing extensions based on some um, scoping reviews. So it's this Prisma SCR. So if I go to uh, the key document here, the Word document, um, opened on my other, because, and the reason for this is that the 27 plus items of 
the regular prisma are not all appropriate for a scoping review. If you were to look through them, you would see there are things that you do with a systematic review with, for instance, um, uh, looking at quality of evidence that you don't typically do with a scoping review. So they've dropped some of those things out. Um, but so this is a 22 item checklist that has to do with for performing a scoping review. So I want to put that out there that this is uh, there are extensions like this specific for scoping reviews. This is a relatively so this is 2018. I thought it was newer than that, but it's relatively new last three years. Um, so for the longest time there was Prisma. And then they've been getting into more of these extensions to look at specific um, subcategories where the original Prisma really isn't appropriate or thorough enough or you know accurate enough, I should say. Um, so those are some of the things that I wanted to talk about. I see we're getting to 1225, and I wanted to end about 1230. So we looked at... So here are my conclusions. Uh, systematic reviews are daunting and very rigorous, as anyone who's performed it, performed one knows. Uh, but guidance exists for developing methodologically sound protocols. So we looked at Prisma, which is that checklist. And by understanding the checklist, it can help you kind of reverse engineer your protocol so that you're able to cross off the items on the checklist when you're done. Um, and so the, the guidance is for the proper reporting of outcomes. Uh, for the methodological rigor, there's also the Cochrane uh, handbook, which I shared. And in, interspersed throughout that are those MECR, MECIR nuggets. Um, but there are also the extensions of Prisma, like um, the scoping review one that I mentioned. And I don't know what's going on with that. Pardon me, that link absolutely worked before, so I don't know what's going on. Um, that is not working now. So I want to thank all of you before I open it up for questions. So thank all of you. And as always, this the next session will be two Wednesdays from now, the same time in the same place, this WebEx. I shared the seminar series guide um, again if you want to send me an email, if you want to be on my e little email uh, list before the session. Uh, but in that session, we're going to be talking about developing a research question. So how one goes from an idea to a research question, which can really drive a systematic review. So let me stop there and see if there are any comments in the chat box or any questions. So I see, yes, so Kevin, yeah, exactly. Um, so the, yeah, that really helps with understanding scoping review. There's some other, if you, and I don't have it with me now, there's some other good articles for describing how a scoping review differs from a systematic review that I'd be happy to share if folks want to email me on that. Um, so I have put the recording for the first session. It is, um, it is, uh, oh, thank you. Yes, that's a good point about the scoping review document putting that in the chat, um, the Prisma document for scoping reviews. The recording is in the guide. So that is, uh, it's linked right here. Unfortunately, it's eventually it's gonna be a fully transcribed recording, but I have not gotten around to doing the transcription. So now it's just the recording from WebEx, um, but it, I'm gonna be updating that hopefully soon. And again, I'll, the recording of this session, I'll post as soon as I can. Um, so thank you for those questions. Other questions at this time? All right, well, I'm not hearing any and I'll pause and talk slowly in case someone's typing. Um, uh, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate your attendance. Actually, let me turn the recorder off. There's no need to keep recording because I don't want to transcribe all this. 